Good evening and welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. My name is Steve Marillo. I am the state section director for this organization called MUFON LA. And our mission is the scientific study of UFOs for the betterment of mankind. We have an excellent speaker tonight. Why are so many UFO TV shows not nearly as good uh, as they should be? Well, tonight we're hoping to find out that answer. Tonight we have with us the producer of the hit TV show UFO Files on the History Channel. His name is Dwayne Tudal, and I'd like to give you a little information on Dwayne. He was raised in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, he went to Townsend University in Baltimore, graduated in 86 uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in TV and film. He's worked on uh, Unsolved Mysteries, uh, UFO Files. He's been in the uh, entertainment business for over 20 years. He got into the UFO field uh, begrudgingly, I guess, in 2002, around about there, and he got into the field as a skeptic. Uh, really, he didn't, he was probably like a lot of people, don't believe in UFOs, think we're all a bunch of crazies running around, so. But as he got into the subject, uh, he started to realize, hey, maybe there's something to it more than uh, what he hears in the reads in the paper. Uh, tonight, Dwayne's going to reveal the sources of the bias and some of the roadblocks he's run into while conceiving and creating um, TV shows such as UFO Files. He's also going to discuss evidence he's uh, found along the way um, that's been made him, turned him from a skeptic to a believer. So uh, without any further ado, um, I'd like you to please welcome Dwayne Tadal. Thank you, everybody. Whoops. Well, hi. Taller than me. Something I envy. Quick show of hands. How many of you, and I can't see many of you, but how many of you watch UFO shows and feel that they're not quite everything you want them to be? Most of you? Okay. I feel the same way. I got into this looking at a lot of these shows and feeling really ripped off. I mean, I was kind of influenced by a lot of these shows, the way I watched them. They would always do a show about Roswell. It always ended with the same thing. Well, there must not be any proof, so it must not have happened. And even though they had great witnesses and great uh, people on there, there was always a skeptic that would say something clever that kind of threw everything off. They would say something like, um, well, it's good to have an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. Now, it's a really funny line, but it doesn't prove anything. It's one of these lines that's just kind of a throwaway. And there are people that I'd see, uh, uh, Stan Friedman, people like that on these shows, and I'd, I'd see at the end of the show, the conclusion was there's no proof. I'd assume there was no proof. So when I got into some of this stuff, I kind of went in as a real non-believer. And growing up, I kind of, I watched, um, I grew up in the 70s, and I used to watch the documentaries, the Chariots of, uh, Chariots of the Gods, all the Eric Von Daniken stuff. And so I was kind of influenced by that. But as I got older, I thought, yeah, yeah, there's not enough proof, not enough evidence, not enough information to make me feel like there's something worth seeing. And even, OK, a great example, a few years ago, how many of you guys watched the uh, Peter Jennings show? Remember the Peter Jennings? Again, a lot of you. Now, the first hour was really great TV. I mean, the first hour, I couldn't believe. I was thinking, oh my god, this is the kind of show I want to see. And then the second hour really screwed me over. It really made me realize that, wait a second, there's a giggle factor out there. And people don't want to know much about this. And they will go out of their way not to tell you things because they're afraid of looking like a fool because they think oh, there's no evidence. So what I started doing as I started getting into some of these shows, I'll go into what I do, but I started looking for evidence. People said, you'll find proof out there. And I thought, well, if I can't find proof, at least I want evidence. So the difference between evidence and proof is evidence is an abundance of information that leads you in a direction, proof being something that gives you absolute. You take the things to court, people would go to jail for it. So I started looking into this and I said, as I started, I thought there's really no evidence. And as I went along, I started looking at some of the evidence. I said, I found out there was photographs. Okay, I expected that. Videos. But I started realizing there were things like uh, multiple witness radar recordings, photos, videos, multiple witness uh, eyewitness uh, reports, radar evidence, radar recordings, physical evidence in the forms of uh, five scientific studies, uh, several government studies, landing imprints, DNA, metal fragments, sightings from uh, upstanding citizens like police officers, judges, astronauts as they talked about, presidents, 
newspaper accounts, burn marks on the ground, glowing rings, changes in soil, damaged property, effects on animals, dead cows, animals making extra noise, jumping out of their pins, uh, running away, not coming home, and psychological effects, physiological effects on people, temporary blindness, radiation sickness, marks on the body, implants in the body, missing time. Now, people say there's not evidence. That's a laundry list of evidence, if you ask me. So I went into this as a real skeptic. This is going to be the journey that I'm going to tell you about, of my journey from being a skeptic to being an open-minded skeptic. I'm not going to say I'm a huge believer, because I want the evidence. But I've given you a list of the evidence that people have brought to me. People have brought to me pieces of metal. We've had it tested. Great, I want to know more about this. But I want to know some of this stuff so I can, you know, I'm one of these people that, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm not one of these guys that, that goes into things thinking there must be a big government conspiracy. But if you can show me things, I'm really open to some of this stuff. Let me give you a little background about myself. I worked at Johns Hopkins, or the, the uh, hospital that worked in, uh, eventually was called Johns Hopkins in Baltimore as a photographer in the uh, pathology department. Um, so I, I did a lot of research when it came to studying photographs and things like that. Uh, when I moved out to Los Angeles, I worked on cops, so I understood when it came to police procedure. Uh, I worked on Unsolved Mysteries. I know you guys watch Unsolved Mysteries? Okay, the reason why I liked Unsolved Mysteries was they would bring people up there and let them talk about it. They'd bring a skeptic and they'd bring a, uh, an expert, and they'd let them both give their points. And not just call each other names, because that's really easy to do, but actually say, I believe it's true because of this, I don't believe it's true because of this, and let them kind of go for it. And in fact, Unsolved Mysteries were the uh, Roswell, uh, a lot of people didn't know that Roswell was kind of re uh, rediscovered through Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, the Cash Landrum case with uh, John Schusler. A lot of these cases, uh, the UFO cases, ended up becoming very well known because we went and really did the research and did the evidence on this stuff. Well, I started working on a show called Who Killed JFK? And it was about the Kennedy assassination. I started realizing, you know, there's a lot of information about this and I really got intrigued with this. And so finally somebody came along to me and said, do you want to edit one of these shows about uh, UFOs, UFO files. And I said, sure, well, you know, it's a job. And I started looking into this, and they still weren't done very well. Some of the producers we had doing them kind of went in with their own bias. And people ask me a lot of times, is there a bias out there with the network? Does the network ever say, you know, you can do this, you can't do that? What I found in my time doing this is it's not really a network bias, it's more the bias of the producers. The producers, the individual producers, will tell you what they want on the show what they don't want on the show. Uh, for example, we had a show called The Gray's Agenda. Well, we really didn't end up doing much about The Gray's Agenda. We ended up doing stuff about Do the Grays Exist? An interesting show, but not exactly the same show we expected. So when I finally got a chance to do a, my first show that I got to produce, we did one called UFO Hunters. Now, UFO Hunters was a show that we decided to do. Uh, it was uh, my producing partner, John Greenwald, and I, John Greenwald, I don't know if you know who he is, he runs the Black Vault. Uh, you ever use, have you guys ever used the Black Vault? Good. Black Vault, and just uh, for those who don't know, is basically the largest um, collection of Freedom of Information Act documents. It has hundreds of thousands of documents. The guy knows everything there is to know about what the government knows about this stuff, what they've released. And a lot of these documents have information that kind of tilts the scale a little bit, saying there might be evidence here, there was wreckage here that got shipped to an airfield here. So that kind of stuff was interesting. And also John is one of these guys that was a young prodigy who knew a lot of people in the UFO field. So he made a lot of calls and we started interviewing a bunch of the experts in this field. Like I said, Stanton Friedman, a guy named Ted Phillips, Barbara Lamb for one, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other people we did, but there was a lot of people that we, across the board, Alex uh, was one of the guys we interviewed for our show. And it basically the show was done, we wanted to show a show that has people that investigate this, without skeptics, without somebody saying, yeah, this guy's a jerk, yeah, this guy's, you know, we wanted to just have people that look into each aspect of ufology. And the case that really got me turned was the case that got a lot of people turned, which is uh, the Socorro, New Mexico case in, uh, on April 24th of 1964. Uh, for those of you who don't know the case, it's the kind of case that changed a lot of people when, within the UFO field. Uh, and all, uh, a police officer named Lonnie Zamora was uh, driving around Socorro, New Mexico, and saw something, went over to where it was, and there was a ship. Now, this is a police officer. Police officers generally don't 
want to talk about there being a ship. But the ship, uh, he saw it, saw people or creatures standing outside of it, saw it take off, and it kind of made a big explosion. Somebody else saw it in distance. They went, uh, they had investigators come. The uh, Project Blue Book came there. They investigated, there was a burn mark. There was heat so much at the uh, area where it launched that the uh, sand had turned to glass. Plants had dried up. There was, a, uh, like I said, a big burn mark. And there was a lot of physical evidence. There was imprints in the ground and footprints where this stuff happened. Now, I can't explain that. Now, you've got an, a case like this where you've got an upstanding citizen, an officer of the law, who says that there's something going on here. He's witnessed this. That intrigues me. Okay, you got me. I'm willing to listen to this a little bit more. And we started talking about some of the cases with that. We started talking about people with uh, implants in the body. Uh, Dr. Roger Lear um, had done a lot of operations where they pull an implant out of the body and test it. Okay, again, you got me aboard. And I, I thought, what a cool subject. And as I started doing this, I realized there is more evidence than I thought there would be. There is a lot of... Um, things out there that you're not going to see. And that's why I like documentaries. Documentaries to me, just to understand what a documentary is exactly, is a documentary takes you somewhere where you usually don't go. I mean, I could put a camera up in the middle of the street. It's not interesting. But if I can take you somewhere where you can't see, that's intriguing. If I can give you information you're not going to normally see, okay, I'm intrigued. It's kind of like uh, the analogy I use with a, a documentary is like it's intriguing like... Um, um, tan lines are. You know, you see a tan line and it's kind of cool to see it. It's something you don't ordinarily see. That's what a documentary is if you can take somebody somewhere that they're not used to. And I worked with Geraldo Rivera years ago and he said one thing to me, he said more than one thing to me, but he said one specific thing to me, that if you're going to have some people watch your show, entertain them. Give them a reason to watch an hour of it because they're inviting you into their home and it's only courteous to entertain them and make them want to come back. And this was back when Geraldo was doing a bunch of big documentaries. We, I happened to work with him because we did the show Cops out of his uh, uh, condo in Marina del Rey, just to give you a little bit of insight into that. But he, that made a lot of sense to me. And I've, I've kind of always gone into my shows with the realization that people watch these shows for a reason. And so many times I watch UFO shows and I'm angry at the end of it. And I don't understand why somebody would think, I'm going to make a UFO show, and at the end, I'm going to make the people who watch this stuff feel like an idiot. Because people aren't going to watch and watch the next week. Uh, would you, uh, most people don't tune into a show the second week if the first week they're told they're stupid. Do you? No. And that's how I feel about the show. And I thought, I want to give these people something, something that they can watch the next week and something they can talk about. And that's why I, I liked UFO. Did, how many of you have seen the episode UFO Hunters uh, that we did? I don't know if any of you have seen it. Okay, what I'm going to do is show just the beginning of uh, two shows. The first one is just the, the opening um, 45 seconds of UFO Hunters, and another one we did called Hangar 18. And then I'll start talking again. <laughs> A shocking surgery to remove an alien implant caught on tape. A flying saucer fragment found. UFO landing sites located. All the work of a special breed of investigator. I have seen an overwhelming amount of physical evidence. I'm absolutely convinced that UFOs are real. These real-life X-Filers believe the truth is out there, and their goal is to discover if science fiction may actually be Science fact, they are UFO hunters. Is the government hiding crashed UFOs beneath Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio? I would say we probably retrieved dozens of crashed saucers. Are there declassified government documents that prove that UFO wreckage was secretly flown to the base? Reports claim anywhere from 14 to 16 bodies were recovered from the ground. For the first time on television, exclusive stories from deep behind the secrecy. I had a top secret SCI clearance. I've never told this story on TV before. Is there a conspiracy to hide UFO evidence at the highest levels of the US government? Or is it all just a myth? 
If you want to know the truth about UFOs, Wright Patterson Air Force Base would be the place to go. Join us as the UFO Files uncovers the facts behind the legend of Hangar 18. So you've seen a little bit of uh, this. Is, those are the beginnings of two of the shows we've done. UFO Hunters uh, was the first one we, we really got into. And let me give you a little background about what was involved with um, how small these shows are. First off, they really have no budget. These shows are, it, it, honestly, if you walked in the office, it was me and John Greenwald, and that was pretty much it for the staff. We had uh, Alex, when I uh, went and interviewed him, I was the camera guy, I was the sound guy. He and I went up to uh, Vasquez Rocks, uh, if you know where that is, up uh, near Agua Dulce, and I set up the camera, and we stood on the side of the road, and I interviewed him for an interview until the local police stopped us <laughs> and said, you know, you can't be doing that here on the side of the road. And we said, okay, we'll stop in a minute. And we did, after they left. And another one came by, and finally we said, okay, now we have to stop. But it looked really cool when you see the show, you see these rocks behind them, it looks like, you know, we spent a little money, which we had no money to do. Um, but a lot of it is done because we like the subject, because the subject has an intrigue to us, and there's so many, like I said, bad shows. And we see up thinking, well, maybe the network's not gonna let us talk about certain things. Maybe they're gonna tell us, you know what, we don't like you doing this, or we don't want you showing proof or evidence. And actually, not once did the network ever say to us, don't do this, don't put this on there. You know, sometimes they say we don't wanna do a show about that, but that was because they just didn't think it'd be a good show. But pretty much every time we wrote up a script, the only thing they would change is, you know, a few words here and there, but they would rarely ever change our content. And that's what intrigued me is that the fact that the, the UFO shows on TV are not bad because the networks asked them to be bad. They're often bad because the producers themselves either don't believe, don't want to believe, don't do the research, don't look into it, and don't care. All they want to do is get their paycheck and go. And that makes me sad because there's a great amount of stories to tell with this stuff. And so rarely are they actually told with passion, with evidence, with people that are convincing. And that's the big thing for me. We didn't end up doing uh, the show after, well, the show after UFO Hunters went, uh, which got a lot of attention, which was really kind of cool. And the network was so intrigued with it, eventually they ended up making a series based on the, on the show, which you've seen called UFO Hunters, which I don't have anything to do with. But uh, the Sci-Fi Channel and the History Channel both were intrigued enough with the concept to make shows about it. And that's, that's great. You know, I'm glad to see that there's a market for this stuff. We ended up doing a show after that called Texas's Roswell, another episode of UFO Files. Now this is another cool story to me. I don't know how many of you know the story of the crash in Aurora, Texas in 1897. Again, hands, got a couple, see a couple. For those of you again who don't know, 1897, it was a uh, Sunday morning as I think, uh, April 17th, 1897, a uh, ship was seen over uh, Aurora, Texas, crashed into a, uh, a farm, into a windmill type thing, blew up, there was supposedly a body in this. Now this is 1897, and people are saying, yeah, it's just one article. Well, actually, the Fort Worth uh, Register, that, uh, that Sunday, or that, uh, that 17th, how, the 19th uh, was the paper, had over 12 articles about this. Not just that sighting, but sightings from judges, sightings from other people. And when you trace it back, over the past six months earlier than that, there were sightings in over 20 states by thousands of witnesses in hundreds of newspapers. Okay, now this is intriguing to me because this is five years before the Wright brothers are flying. Okay, I'm even more intrigued. We can't explain that. There's nothing that could have been doing this, a cigar-shaped craft flying around at high speeds. Okay, it can't be a government cover-up, can't be imagination. Even if, let's say, we eliminate 99.9% .9 of the witnesses as crazy, there's still a few, and all you really need is one. Now, if you have a crash, the body was uh, found in this, the quote, and I want to read the quote exactly in the paper because this is what intrigues me. The quote in the paper said, it was not an inhabitant of this world. Okay, again, I'm intrigued. There was uh, 
wreckage, body, the body was buried. They had a civil, fun they had a Christian funeral for the body. There was a marker in the local graveyard. Okay, more evidence that I think is intriguing. Then they found metal. Even more intriguing, the metal was tested. The metal turned out to be an aluminum type thing that looked like metal. Uh, it had the properties of metal that had been melted from a crash or from a burn, from a, you know, from a high thing, in a way that could not have been done back in that time. Okay, more and more and more. Another piece of evidence, there was on the property, uh, was eventually owned by a man named ba uh, Brawley Oates. Brawley Oates was a man who uh, got terrible rheumatoid arthritis. Actually, there's a picture of him on here. I will tell you when he goes by. But you can see how bad his knuckles are. His knuckles are so bad, he had the worst rheumatoid. There he is. See that shot going by in the back there? That's his fingers. It looked like golf balls in his fingers. Now, he says he got that from drinking the water from the well. The well was right beneath the thing that crashed. A lot of the metal supposedly went into the well. OK, so you have radiation. You have uh, physiological effects on somebody. You have metal. You have newspaper accounts. You have hundreds of witnesses accounts long before flights were happened. This is a story that, to me, needs to be told. I don't understand why somebody wouldn't say, well, let me look into this a little bit. So what we did was my co-producer and I went down there to Aurora, Texas, spent some time going to the cemetery. The marker's gone. The marker that marked the grave is gone, and then nobody knows where the grave is. OK, that kind of sucks a little bit, but we'll proceed. Um, we went and interviewed local people, found out there were people that said that they knew people that were witnesses, that they said they testified to the fact that this happened. OK, so you've got people that went on record saying this happened. Again, all these great stories. And the network not once said to us, you know what? This is hitting too close to home. We don't want you to do this. They said, we love this. Network wants to have intriguing stories. They want to have stories that people are talking about. They want to have shows that make you, want, again, want to watch the next week. And this was one of those shows. So I was very happy to have had a part in this. Um, trying to think if there's anything else about that. That seems to be pretty much that for that case. I wish there was more cases out there like this. There are some, and I'm going to go into some more like that. We started talking uh, about additional shows we wanted to do. We started looking into some of the people we profiled in UFO hunters. And one of the guys was a guy named Ted Phillips. Now, again, Ted Phillips, for those of you who don't know, Ted Phillips is sort of the preeminent guy when it comes to trace evidence. He is the guy that goes out there. He's investigated over 3,000 cases of UFO landings that have physical traces on the ground, whether it's burn marks, whether it's imprints, things like that. Things that really can't be explained, things that can be tested, things that can't be recreated, and things that are not just a photograph, a blurry photograph. Because too many times, I think there's a, a group of people out there that everything they see in the sky is a UFO. And there's another group that feels like no matter how much evidence there is, there's no UFO. So you've got somebody like Ted Phillips who goes out, really researches this stuff. He was uh, trained by, G, uh, by uh, J. Allen Hynek, who ran Project Blue Book. He went out and investigated a lot of these things, a lot of all these states. And he gave us some of his best cases. And we even took him to one of the cases, and we reinvestigated some of the stuff. Let me give you some details of one of the best cases he did. Did one in a place called Delphos, Kansas. Hold on for one second. Delphos, Kansas is really in the middle of the state, and it was on a uh, Tuesday, November 2nd, 1971. A guy named Ronnie Johnson uh, worked on his farm, young guy, and saw this thing spinning. Couldn't understand what it was. It was off the ground, but it was letting out this kind of mist that went down, and he saw it. It uh, kind of started going away. It was really bright. It hurt his eyes a little bit. Uh, it took off, knocked over a tree. It was seen by the rest of his family. His dog uh, ran away from it. His, the sheep were jumping out of the pen. It's a big deal. His family came out. When the thing had left, and they saw it going off in the distance, not just seeing it up close, but seeing it travel away. And it was going against the wind. So it's not one of these things that could have been a big bag or something. When they went over to it, there was a glowing ring. Now, this is the kind of case you don't hear about a lot because this is something right there. Irma Johnson ran in the house, got her camera. She had one picture left on a Polaroid, took a picture. The picture showed a glowing ring. Now, what's intriguing about this is there's no reason for this ring to be there. And the ring 
which was interesting to me, was not just a, a regular ring. It looked more like a horseshoe. It was a, um, a ring that the far end had been kind of uh, blown, like uh, dissipated. And if somebody was going to fake that, they'd probably just do a circle. You know, why would anybody think the wind would be taking some of this? So they, uh, the Irma touched the, uh, the glowing stuff, and her fingers became numb. Whoa, what's going on with that? Wipes it on her leg. Her leg becomes numb. Her, leg became, uh, her legs and fingers became numb and stayed numb for over 20 years. Now that's intriguing to me. Again, some sort of physical proof. They started testing this stuff, and, and uh, it was eventually tested, and it showed to have an, a, a large amount of full, uh, I wrote it down to make sure I got it right. Fulvic acid was what it had. Uh, the other thing it had was um, Folic? Is it folic acid? No, it's not folic acid. Fulvic. It was, it was different than I, because it's not folic acid. Um, I don't have the notes of what it was exactly. But anyway, it, it was also the, the soil became hydro, uh, hydro, hydrophobic, which meant it wouldn't absorb water. And it meant that when it snowed, the snow wouldn't melt on it. You could pour water on it, and the water would just dissipate. And now this is, there's no reason to have this. There's no reason to make this circle any different. They started investigating this, and there's, they weren't trying to make money off of this. There's no real reason for this to have been faked. And that's what intrigues me. Okay, you've got a family who had no experience trying to do this before, who all saw something. There was physical trace evidence on the ground, physiological damage to the people, animals reacted to it, trees uh, and tree limbs messed up because of this. All this stuff based on something that we can't explain. I'm aboard. I'm good with this. I'm intrigued. So we put that in one of our shows, and we went and, and re-examined this soil 35 years later. We went to Ohio, went to an uh, uh, um, analytical uh, physicist uh, named Phyllis Buttinger, and she tested again for us for the first time in 35 years, and it did the same exact thing. You could pour water on it, and water would dissipate. She put it in a test tube, shook it, it still stayed up there. We had soil that was taken outside of the, example, the sample reel, the sample area, and it was normal soil. Now soil that's two feet away, normal, soil in the ring, damaged, as if it was coated with something, and they couldn't figure it out. So there's something that was up there, levitating, dropping something on here, that changed the ground. Evidence, again evidence, and that makes me feel like something is there. We did another case on the same show, in Cato, Missouri, another case, four witnesses, broad daylight again. And the, the cases in the daylight are the most intriguing to me. Because, again, you usually hear Zeke and Cletus in a swamp see a light while they're drinking moonshine. And that's, you know, intriguing, but it's not always the case I want to be reporting on. So this was uh, Sunday, October 8, 1978. Four witnesses, a four-foot, uh, four um, not disc, but shape, which was on the ground. Uh, they started up a tractor. It bounced up in the air about 10 feet up in the air. It started flying around against the wind. Um, it uh, uh, left a burn mark. Again, all the grass in the area dead. Uh, the grass outside is superheated, so much so that some of these plants curled in on themselves and the dirt that was blown out was inside the plants. Okay, you're not going to get that without some sort of propulsion being blown out. It went up. The witnesses saw it go that way, that way, and they saw it go up and meet with another ship above it. No photographs, but physical evidence on the ground. And they tested it. Again, the, the soil was distinctly different than the soil right outside. That kind of stuff makes me think that there's cases out there worth reporting. And you have officers reporting. You have, again, astronauts like we talked about earlier. You have presidents that are saying, I've seen this stuff. You have scientists out there that are looking into ufology and, and, and realizing that there is something to this. There is something. And when they started telling me these stories, I, I'm my, I have the greatest job on the planet because what I get to do is go and meet these people that investigate this stuff. I get to go to their homes. I get to spend a day with them. These are the kind of people you pay to go see. And I get to spend the time with them and they tell me the details about what they found and what they learned and why they did this. And when you realize that these people aren't out to make a buck, because most of them don't make much money. Most of them are just wanting this to be told. And that intrigues me because these people, I think, have pure motives too. Uh, and they're fighting things. This is the thing they're fighting. Every time we went out on these shoots, 
we would go to a town in, in North Dakota, and I'm sure you guys have seen articles like this, and it would say, UFO files beams down to, to Fargo. Well, that kind of makes it sound like we're an idiot, a bunch of knuckleheads. You know, beams down, they had a show on, uh, we saw a show on, um, uh, it was a Dateline or something, they had the top 10 UFO cases. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen these kind of shows, but all the other times they do a top 10 murders and top 10 crimes, they're really serious. And then they start doing top 10 UFO cases and they show clips from Star Trek on it. The people are always saying, beam me up, set phasers on stun. Well, they make it seem like there's not anybody that takes this stuff seriously. And they look at all of you and think you're idiots. And that makes me sad because a lot of the people I've met in this are really people that want to know this stuff. And I think that what's going to happen is eventually the, enough evidence is going to come out that the tide is going to turn and they're going to look at you guys and think, how did you guys get here before we did? Because I think that you guys have an edge over a lot of people because you're listening and you're looking and you're watching things. And that makes me almost want to be in the group because I feel like you guys are a little bit ahead of the, of the curve on this. And I, I'm intrigued with that. And that's one of the reasons I got into this is because I had so many questions going into that. I'll go over some of the questions I have when I got into this, but I had so many questions going into this. And I started looking at this and thinking, there's stories to be told. And when there's stories like this to be told, how can you not tell them? How can you not want these stories out there for everybody out there to be in there? Um, we did another show called Hangar 18. And how many of you have heard of what Hangar 18 is? Hangar 18, for those of you who don't know, is a somewhat mythical hangar on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. The story is, and the documents say, that there were wreckage from Roswell that was shipped to Wright, well, it was Wright Field at the time, but Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. There's documents that actually say it looked like it might have been um, a weather balloon, but that's not sure. They're not sure about this, so they weren't sure about what the things were. So we started looking into this and started thinking, well, what is it at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that would make them take it, take this stuff there? And we looked into this and we found out that it is the home of, I'm going to read some of these to you so you know exactly what they are. They're the home of a lot of Air Force research labs, the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, the Air Force Materiel Command, a lot of flight tests, vast underground bases, uh, the FTD, the Foreign Technology Division. Now, Foreign Technology Division is the group of people that reverse engineers things. If we capture a uh, Russian MiG, it's flown to Wright-Patterson for reverse engineering. Now, why wouldn't they take something that was found that's technology that we don't know to Wright-Patterson and try to reverse engineer it? Well, that makes sense. If you're going to take it somewhere, take it to the people that can do this stuff. Take it to the people that know how to do this stuff. Uh, also, Project Blue Book was done there. I don't know, a lot of people didn't realize that, but Project Blue Book was done right on the base. And Project Blue Book was the preeminent uh, investigation of UFOs for the U.S. government until 1969, when they supposedly stopped. Supposedly, there's still an investigation going on. It's just not called Project Blue Book. But it was conducted there. So what's intriguing to me is there's the possibility that they're investigating UFOs in one building, and there's proof positive that UFOs exist in two buildings away. That's interesting to me. So we thought, why don't we do a show about Hangar 18, where we go and actually see if we can get on the base. Again, documentaries take you to somewhere where you haven't been. So we called the base, and they said, sure. We'd love to have you. And we're like, you know this is a show called UFO Files. Sure, come on on, come on on. So we got there, we got to interview uh, the uh, Colonel um, Andrew Weaver, was his name, who was the head of the base. He said he had one stipulation. Can't ask me any questions about UFOs. Okay. But can we ask you about reverse engineering and things like that? He said, yeah, absolutely. So we asked him what they do. And what they do, again, is take technology that's found and bring it back. And he said, not really, uh, he didn't want to talk about UFOs. But we did talk to somebody who worked on the base that did talk about UFOs a little bit. There's also a group called, uh, a thing called Project um, Moondust. Have you ever heard of Project Moondust? Project Moondust was started in the 50s by the U.S. government to, and I want to read this exactly so you know, to uh, retrieve non-U.S. space objects or objects of unknown origin. Now, this is several years before Sputnik. So there really isn't anything in space. But they created a group called Project Moondust and Operation Blue Fly 
uh, that would go out and retrieve crashed technology and bring it back to Wright-Patterson. Now, there's government documents that say this is, in, this is true. There's cases that were in Chad and other countries that say a globe went down or a ship of some sort crashed and it was shipped to Wright-Patterson to be researched. Okay, again, I'm intrigued. They let us go all over the base. They, gave, they said, you know, is there anything you want to see? And we said, yeah, we'd like to see the uh, cryogenic chambers. They didn't really show us cryogenic chambers where they're aliens, but we did ask them and they said no. We got pretty much the PR tour. But what they did was they said, this is the building that used to be considered Hangar 18. It's now Building 23. These are the stories. And we had people we interviewed that said, this is the information we got. There's underground chambers. There are witnesses that say that there were UFOs that were there, that there were alien bodies that were there. We found a woman named June Crane. Now, June Crane had passed away several years ago, but a man named Jim Clarkson had interviewed her. Now, June Crane was a... Um, Legal, a, a typist there, and she had all the paperwork to show that she was there. But her interview was fascinating because she, her interview, she said, I remember three to four crashes being brought to Wright-Patterson back in the 50s, including Roswell. Okay. She said, I remember bodies being brought there, and I remember people talking about that. I remember playing with metal. Okay, that's really intriguing. Why didn't she say this before? Well, she had signed a non-disclosure agreement that said, she would have to pay $10,000 if she talked about this. But when she got to the point where she was old, she said, you know what, I'm 72 years old, what are they gonna do? Put me in jail, you know? So she talked, and she talked and talked, and we put that interview on TV for the first time. And what's interesting about it is she was saying a lot of this stuff, very casually actually, and that intrigued me again. All this stuff, I wouldn't do a show unless it gave me something that made me feel like this is a story worth telling. And the June Crane story was something worth telling. She was a witness. She held the medal. She talked to the people. She, I don't remember if she saw the bodies, but the people around her saw the bodies. And she talked about the wreckage. And she knew dates, which cor uh, corroborated uh, dates that we know of from crashes that we've heard of. OK, I'm, I'm again, aboard. Um, we interviewed a guy named Robert Collins. He had a book called Exempt from Disclosure, which is a great book about Hangar 18 and talked about uh, the underground cha uh, chambers. To tell you how secretive this stuff was, this stuff was so secretive that J. Edgar Hoover himself couldn't see it. There's a document where he said, I wanted to see the, uh, the, basically the Roswell wreckage. It was written, the document was written the week of the Roswell crash. And he said, I wanted to get in there and I couldn't. Another guy wanted to get in there was uh, Senator Barry Goldwater. And you guys know who Senator Barry Goldwater ran for president in 1964. And he couldn't even get in. He went to the, uh, the head of the base and said, look, I know you got a place where you put all this stuff, and I'd like to see it. And the head of the base said, you know, don't ever ask me that again. I don't care who you are. Shut your yap. Get out of my face. And said, I don't want to know about this. So even high-ranking officials in the government couldn't get in there. So there's something about this that was going on. So what we did was we went to, we got... Uh, uh, witnesses that saw the Roswell crash. We went and talked about the, there's a crash in Aztec, New Mexico, which happened a year after that. And a lot of this stuff, um, we found documents, witnesses, and all this that told a story about Wright-Patterson. And we got on there, took the documentary where you could go, where people couldn't see before. I want to show you a clip that we did for this show, if we can. Uh, this is a, a part of the show called, uh, we did where we did a crash in Aztec. And uh, again, this is coordinated by two people. We had uh, one or two other additional people that, or a number of additional people which helped with the shoot. But this is the kind of show we like to do. Okay. March 25th, 1948, Aztec, New Mexico. What starts as a normal day for local oil workers turns into an encounter with the unknown. As they approach the western edge of the mesa, a large silver object grabs their attention. When the oil workers got to the mesa, there was a disc approximately 100 feet in diameter. Because the ship is found intact, it appears to be a landing as opposed to a crash. 
The witnesses I talked to, both Ken Farley and Doug Nolan, young men at the time, would not enter the craft. Bill Ferguson, the foreman, uh, more senior gentleman, uh, was yelling at the, the workers to get away from it. Except for a shattered porthole, there isn't any immediate sign of damage. Doug Nolan reported to me he saw two bodies through the porthole slumped over. Within hours, trucks arrived, supposedly from Camp Hale, Colorado. It appears the U.S. government has another UFO incident to contend with. Having learned from their mistakes at Roswell, the Army quickly takes control of the situation. Roswell, nine months earlier, had been sort of botched by putting it on the front page of many newspapers around the country. I think the military had really fine-tuned their skills on going in and retrieving a downed flying disc or UFO. The secrecy started immediately upon the military's arrival at the crash site. They separated the uh, locals and uh, reminded them of their patriotic duty for the United States and swore them to secrecy. 58 years ago, you told to shut up for national security, you did it because you respected and trusted the government. The military wanted that craft immediately and they would do whatever it took to get it out of there. According to the eyewitnesses, the Army recovers between 14 and 16 badly burned alien bodies from the craft. The recovery team reportedly brings both the ship and the alien corpses to a local safe house, away from the media. Take it to the nearest military base where you can control access to it, and then you arrange to ship it to an appropriate place, depending on what you want done. But again, Wright-Patterson would be the eventual repository. Because of the number of alien bodies at Aztec, it is considered one of the most significant UFO retrievals to date. But UFO researchers say there are many other cases tied to Wright Field. October 1947, Paradise Valley, Arizona. May 1953, Kingman, Arizona. June 1953, Laredo, Texas. And December 5, 1965, Kecksburg, Pennsylvania are only a few of the alleged flying saucer recoveries in the U.S. alone. No matter where a UFO lands, it seems all roads lead back to Wright-Patterson and Hangar 18. So you see there's a lot of these cases that really aren't talked about. Aztec is one of these stories that you don't really hear a lot about. And to me, I'm one of these guys that has a lot of questions. I'm a, I'm a why kind of guy because a lot of the, the what, or well, not really the what, but the, the who, the uh, when, the where, they're answered in one word sentence. You know, where? Aztec, New Mexico. What? I'm not sure. Probably a saucer of some sort. But the why questions are when I start to get intrigued. And when I ask people these things, usually those are the kind of questions people open up on. People start to say, when you ask them what they did, they tell you. When you ask them when they did, they tell you the date. When you ask them why they did something, then they start telling you about something about this. And I started thinking to myself about the UFOs and why. Why were a lot of my questions. Uh, when I went into this stuff, why would they come here? Why don't they land on the White House lawn? You know, all these kind of questions I had. And I started realizing there are specific answers for some of this stuff. And as I started doing these shows, I started realizing what some of these answers were. And it really started looking into this, like a, sort of like a police officer would look into this investigating you do your who what when where and why and you start to fill in the blanks of this stuff and that's what I started doing with these things and and um, that's what's frustrating to me when I see a lot of these shows I don't think they ask questions beyond what the normal person would want to know and you guys are people that have looked at a lot of UFO shows you guys are obviously intrigued with this stuff you guys are people that want to see something you haven't seen before I mean, how many shows can you do about Roswell and always end with the fact that, yeah, there was bodies that were dropped out of a plane 
That's what it must have been. Okay, no aliens. You know, and after a while, you don't want to watch these things. And my goal is to bring shows that make you want to come back for more. My goal is to make a show that intrigues you, makes you look into more, makes you want to read, makes you look up things, makes you question things. I don't want to do, I, I don't want my bias to be on the show. My goal when I do these shows is I don't want you to know what my opinion about UFOs is. I want you to wonder, does he believe, does he not believe? Because he's not ramming it down my throat. He's just giving me the evidence. Here's the cases, here's the evidence, here's the situation. You decide. We make a court case type thing. We lay it out and let you decide. I'm not going to Michael Moore something and kind of create opinions in these things. I want you to watch it and make a decision for yourself. Kind of like Unsolved Mysteries. So that's what it really did kind of influence me. So when I started looking into these questions I had looking into this, um, I started thinking about some of this stuff. Um, again, why don't they land on the White House lawn? And I started... Uh, because that's always a question you, you always hear. People come up to me and say that's the first, when I'm interviewed for things, why don't they land on the White House lawn? Well, first off, the White House is not the, it's not the main place, it's not the government of Earth, it's just the government of the United States. But second off, look at what we do when we go and study some jungle people, or apes in the jungle or something. What do we do? We study them from afar. We don't actually go right up next to their fire with a video camera and say, smile. We say, okay, we're going to watch them from as far away as we can with our cameras and try to get footage of them. You know, how many of you guys watch uh, any of these, like Planet Earth and shows like that where they show these things? They're not right up in these animals' faces. They're kind of watching them from afar. Well, that's sort of maybe what they're doing. Who's to say they're not watching us from afar, watching us doing things? Who's to say when we talk about, well, we, what do we do with the animals till we can follow them? We tag them. We, not, you know, we tag and number them. Who's to say that some of these implants that people are finding in bodies aren't that. Who's to say that, that they're not doing exactly what we would do? People say, how do they get here? You know, well, the technology, how do they make it here? Well, I started asking people about this. I asked, you know, nuclear physicists about this. I asked people that would know because I don't. And the best explanation I heard was this. We've only been flying for a hundred years. It's really arrogant to think that we are as advanced as it's going to get. It doesn't get any more advanced than us. Well, we're basically using the same way we flew 100 years ago. A propeller, forward motion, and that's about it. We really haven't changed our technology much when it comes to flight. Even rockets are not really a, a dramatic change in the way we fly. Jets, the fastest jets we have, still are basically the same concept as the Wright brothers. Who's to say there's not somebody that's 100,000 years or a million years ahead of us? They've discovered all kinds of new technologies and things like this that we wouldn't even conceive of. I mean, we, people say, what's the next version of technology going to be? I have no idea. Nobody knew that the uh, vacuum bulb would be replaced by the transistor. It's not a natural logical progression. It's a leap. The next leap may make us have ships, may make us have things that can travel faster and defy some of the physics that we have already. I don't know, but what I'm intrigued with is the fact that there are technologies out there probably that know more about this stuff than we do, that, if we, if, that look like magic to us. If we took TV back 100 years ago and showed somebody a high-def TV, well, we'd probably be burned at the stake for magic, and they wouldn't understand it. Well, it's the same thing with us seeing things. We can't explain them. There are things that are beyond our scope, and we can only think in terms of what we understand. I see things, and I always try to process it through my brain. I try to process arguments through my brain. I try to process things I see, photographs, video. Everything I do, I can only process through what I know. And who's to say there's not a lot of things we don't know? We only use a small percent of our brain. Who's to say there's not technology we don't understand? So that was one question. Disclosure. Now you hear people talking about disclosure all the time. Will the government have disclosure? And it seems to me now, with so much talk about UFOs, it seems like every other day there's something in the papers about UFOs. And everybody says, well, disclosure's probably just around the corner. Well, there's people that out there that are saying this, that have been saying this for years, that the, the, the disclosure's right around the corner. I personally don't think there is. I don't think the government's going to disclose anything until they have to. It's in their best interest not to. If they've got technology right now that allows them to reverse engineer things, which I still don't know whether or not they'd be able to reverse engineer something because, again, if you went back in time and were able to give 
uh, a nuclear sub to Christopher Columbus and say, okay, this is great, make me two more, odds are he couldn't do it. Who's to say we could reverse their engineering? But there's no, if they could, if we can as a government do that, why would we release technology like that to our enemies? If you release it to them, they have the same technology. And if we're using this for war or whatever, why would we do that? We would never have the upper hand. So there's no reason for the government to ever have disclosure, unless you have something that's catastrophic on a scale of 9-11 involving extraterrestrials. Then I think disclosure would come out. But until then, there's really no reason for them to release any information like that. Um, again, I, uh, whether these things are influenced by networks, they weren't. They were not uh, the giggle factor. Uh, again, we talked about how we re relate to um, technology and things like this. I, I, I use the analogy of, remember a few months ago there was a, a tribe that was found in Brazil and they flew over and there was footage of the guys down there's a jungle tribe that had never been seen before in the rainforest and they're pointing and shooting arrows up at the helicopter. That's kind of like we are. We don't really know. We see something strange in the sky, and what do we do? We shoot things at it. We get involved with this. We don't know what's going on. We're kind of like those jungle guys. You know, uh, the analogy was made one time to me that uh, landing here on Earth is going to be this, uh, the same as when the uh, Mayflower landed, Christopher Columbus landed in the New World, except this time we're the Indians, standing there on the beach going, oh, not, trying, not understanding what it is that's coming here. And I think that's kind of the way we are with this stuff. Um, let's see if there's any other questions I had about this. Mostly that's what it was. And, and so my, when I started looking at this, I realized that there's not only proof, uh, not only evidence, there may be even proof. And I started being very intrigued with this about the fact that there's enough to take to court. There's enough that if you take some of this stuff to court, you could, you could use these people's testimony to convict somebody of murder, send them to jail for life. Why is it when these same people testify about this stuff, they're ignored, they're scoffed at, they're laughed at, and I don't know, and it's the giggle factor, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. And that's why we do these shows, is to try to get beyond the giggle factor, to try to get to the point where we can present real, physical evidence. And I think the shows are starting to go that way, I'm hoping, I don't know, my goal show is to do a show about ufology that consists of taking the evidence, whatever it is, and testing it. Testing it to make sure it's real, and if it's not, take it off the table, bring the next one in. That's my goal, is to have something like that. So we'll see about that. I think I'm just about done with this. In conclusion, again, the reason why I make these things is because when you've got stories like this, how can you not tell them? How can you not want to get these stories out there? And when you've got an audience that wants to know this stuff, I mean, for you guys to come in here on an August night, hot August night, sit through a half an hour of everybody setting up, and want to listen to somebody that's just made you TV, that's the coolest thing on the planet. Now, what I, the thing I'm excited about is some of you guys are going to talk to me after this and tell me, here's an interesting case, here's a story, why don't you do this, and that's going to fuel me for the next batch of things. And that's going to make me want to do something that you guys want to see. And that's what I want to do. Uh, give a warm round of applause. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.